Anderson is absent. Otherwise, you have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the minutes should have been uh, sent out. Did I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And then we'll move right into the official action, Resolution 1332. Commissioners, I remind you last month you uh, passed the fire protection rate on first reading. I recognize Mark Walker to recap that for the purpose of second reading. <coughs> Commissioners, just a few brief comments uh, this afternoon on Resolution 1332, which is submitted to you today for second reading. Um, the board may recall, as we discussed last <laughs> month, that KUP's water system um, includes additional capacity in its treatment plant, its transmission mains, its storage and pumping facilities to be able to provide the water flow needed by the city of Knoxville to meet the fire service needs of citizens <laughs> of Knoxville. And there is a cost associated with providing and maintaining that capacity, and KUB recovers that cost through an annual charge to the city of Knoxville, which is based in part on the public fire protection rate adopted by the board. Going back to 2002, the board, at the request of the city, adopted a rate and set it basically for a period of three years. And at the end of the three-year period, we would have a true up at the city to ensure that we continue to recover our cost on an appropriate basis. Um, earlier this year, I had discussions with the city's finance director, Jim York, about public fire protection rates. And in those discussions, he expressed an interest or a desire for to no longer use that three-year rate model and basically for the board to adopt a rate each year and basically have smaller annual increases as opposed to a increase every three years, which would be relatively larger. So based on that and given the fact that the board last <laughs> adjusted the fire protection rate in 2012, we are proposing an increase for fiscal year 2016 and an increase for fiscal year 2017. And those increases are to be consistent with the levels of increase that the board approved for other water rates back in 2014. And I'll also mention the very last bullet here that we still have a true up um, that is resulting from the end of the current three year arrangement and that is $277,000 that the city owes to KUP, and we are proposing to amortize that over the next three years until it's paid back. But I'll point out that that true up amount is not part of the rates that we're asking the board to adopt. It's separate from that and will be added to the bill. And the city fully understands this. After first reading, I did follow up with Jim York and mentioned that the board had adopted it on first reading, so that amount for FY16 is in their budget, so I think we're, we're good to go. So resolution 1332, again, for your consideration on second reading today, does provide for an increase in the public fire protection rate effective July 1st, 2015, and another increase effective July 1st, 2016. And I'd be happy to answer any questions the board might have. Okay, there's no questions. Could I have a request for a motion and a second? Resolution 1332 and second final reading. So moved. Uh, do we have anyone else to speak on this? If not, Mr. Foley, would you please follow up? Yes, uh, Commissioner Hamilton. Aye. Commissioner Herbert. Aye. Commissioner Pinnell. Aye. Commissioner Thompson. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner Warden. Aye. All right, resolution 1332 is passed. Uh, commissioners, you've heard about the uh, TDOT project on Alcoa Highway. That's a very, very challenging project for KUB from an engineering perspective, perspective, construction perspective. But it's also got a very, very tight schedule, and we are required to have our easements available much quicker than we typically do. Because of that, we're going to ask for blanket condemnation authority, and I'll recognize Julie Childers to introduce that. shows the limits of the project beginning at uh, Woodson Drive, extending south 
They're a little south of Blundy. Uh, right now in most areas, Alcoa Highway is four lanes wide. Uh, this project is going to take it from four lanes out to six lanes and then have frontage roads on both sides of that. In addition, there's going to be three bridges that cross at different points um, throughout the, this section of the project, which means there's ramps and there's roundabouts. And so the overall footprint of the Alcoa Highway project is going to be a lot larger than it is today. In most areas, the, the, um, the cross section will be about 170 feet wide from side to side. So needless to say, that's going to require relocation of all of our utilities um, in association with this project. The project was originally conceived by PDOT in the year 2000, and there have been various starts and stops since that time. In 2003, there was a new law in, introduced called Chapter 86, and the purpose of that was to help um, utilities and PDOT work together to better partner and help these projects to go more smoothly. Um, PDOT has a, a, a discretion to be able to allow for a reimbursement to the utilities uh, when they so decide. On this particular project, since it was started before the legislation was introduced, um, <coughs> decided to use their discretion not to reimburse it. So basically, um, KUB will be responsible for the full cost, they are almost $7 million for utility relocations. One thing you may note that even though the project is only 1.7 miles long, our utilities are longer than that. Especially you see that on water and gas. That's because we need to have utilities on both sides of the roads because the road is so, so wide. Um, and there's also cross streets that have to be tied in and have new utilities on those as well. As Ms. Roach mentioned, this is a major project and um, we were just notified that it was going to be restarted uh, back in the fall. So immediately we started our designs and finished those up in March and then in April we started preparing our easement documents. Uh, just this past week we had all the easement documents delivered to us and so now we're ready to start um, the easement procurement process. So the requirement is by PDOT that we have all of our utilities in place by December when they're getting ready to bid the project. So that creates um, a situation where we need to start by October if any of these are not negotiated successfully by October and need to go to the condemnation process, that's when we would need to start it. So on this particular project, we do have 60 easements that need to be obtained. Um, most every parcel will have more than one utility on it. But each property owner will have one document that shows whatever is required for each individual utility on that. We'll go through our normal negotiation process, but the blanket condemnation uh, gives some extra steps to help uh, smooth the way. First of all, we'll go get a third party property appraisal, and then we go back to the property owner with that appraisal that's specific to their property and attempt to negotiate again. After that happens, then we can uh, start the, the uh, condemnation process. This shows the extent of the number of easements that we need to obtain. Um, the parcels are, are completely filled in, but of course we'll just be getting easements along generally the frontage of Alcoa Highway itself or some of the side streets. But that shows um, the extent of the property that are required. This is a little bit of history. Over the past 10 years, we've had, um, we have acquired successfully over 2,400 easements. And 99% of those were obtained through normal negotiations. We only had 24 in which we actually started the condemnation process in 10 years. So even once we started the condemnation process, um, sometimes those got resolved before going all the way through. We did have 14 that were resolved by agreement after they were filed with the court. We had one that was dismissed because the project changed. Uh, several that were resolved by default judgment. That means once it's uh, put in with the court, um, if the property owner does not come to offer an objection, then it continues on through the process. And we have four from the south loop that are still in process. And what that means is after the project is finished, then the court decides what the compensation is. So overall, our track record has been uh, uh, very good and be able to negotiate without condemnation uh, 99% And even with blanket condemnation, that does not change our normal negotiation strategy. Uh, we still deal one-on-one -on -one with the property owners in good faith. Um, the only thing that this helps us with is once we get to the point where we realize it's not going to be able to be negotiated successfully, that we can have an accelerated legal process to move it through the system. As I mentioned, we have a third-party valuation. A lot of times that helps us negotiate uh, successfully. 
and then the property owner has the ability to offer an appeal uh, once the condemnation is filed with the right of entry coming um, before the monetary settlement at the end. So in summary, Resolution 1333, <coughs> a blanket condemnation of the necessary temporary and permanent easements. And I did also want to mention that similar to South Loop, that um, if we decide that a property needs to go to condemnation, that the board members will be notified by email, a uh, minimum of 10 days in advance, and they're given an opportunity to raise their hand and ask for a discussion at the next board meeting before we proceed any further. Are there any questions? Julie, what kind of communication is going on out there with regard to this pro project? I know when we have been in charge of projects, uh, we've been very good about engaging the community and discussing uh, issues with them to hopefully uh, address questions before uh, some sort of crisis arises. Uh, what's being done in this situation? Well, DDOT has acquired most of their right of way already, so they've been in contact with all of these property owners. They still probably have a few more to negotiate, but the property owners along the trail will be well aware of what's going to happen just because of that. Julie, can you go back to the timeline? for you not to ask for a blanket condemnation and go through your normal process? Does that mean that you, you know, instead of December, it would be January or it would be February? What is the normal? It's hard to say, really. Um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll get 90% of them fairly quickly, and then the last 10% are the ones that really take a long time to negotiate. And sometimes you're just not able to negotiate. And remind me, Julie, if we don't meet the deadline, there are fines against KDB for That's failure. Correct. That was part of the magic, you know, December 2015. Okay. Which affects all of our And uh, one more question about that: the cost to move the utilities and to add new utilities on both sides of the road. That cost is just for the utility. It doesn't include uh, negotiation and purchase of any property, or is it? It's just an easement. That's Okay, so that'll be in addition to that 6.8. Actually, that's included in the oh, it is included. Yeah, oh, it is. easements okay. are in that number. Yeah. We included engineering, inspection, construction, everything in that number. But I'll remind you that we don't buy property for our use. We buy easements, and people can then go back and use, use it for parking or whatever. Mm -hmm. We don't encumber that for buildings, but not for parking and other access. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Does anybody have any more questions? If not, can I request the motion and a second on resolution 1333 on first and final reading. So moved. Second. Mr. Coley, could you please call the roll? Oh, excuse me, let me ask if there's a comment first. Sorry. If not, Mr. Coley, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Herbert? Aye. Mr. Pinnell? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. And Commissioner Warden? Aye. All right. Resolution 1333 is passed. President. Speaking of projects, uh, we have the Cumberland, Cumberland Avenue project in which we're working with <coughs> the city to do that. Um, I'm actually sorry Commissioner Anderson isn't here because he drives it to and from work every day. So he has lots of opinions about that project. But I want to uh, recognize Mark Rawhoff, our manager of water and wastewater, to share with you that we have completed phase one and what we have ahead of us. Commissioners? As you're aware, uh, the city's Cumberland Avenue streetscape project began earlier this year in April. And uh, as a reminder, the purpose of this project is to improve the aesthetics along this corridor, as well as uh, traffic and also pedestrian flow. Um, after two uh, unsuccessful attempts to bid this project, the city approached KUB and asked us if we'd be willing to bid the, uh, the work separately. The roadway work is one bid and the utilities uh, as a second bid. And uh, the city agreed that they would take care of all project communication. And uh, so we uh, talked about that internally and we decided that that would be a good approach to take. And the result was is that we have one contractor who's able to do both the roadway and the utility work, and that's Southern Constructors. And those items are listed here. Uh, this slide shows the extent of the project, which uh, 
is along Cumberland Avenue, beginning over here on the University Commons Way, and it goes eastward to 16th Street. This project will be done in two phases. Phase one of KUB's work uh, began April the 6th, and it uh, included water, wastewater, and gas work in the Cumberland Avenue area from West Volunteer Boulevard to just east of 22nd Street also included work on 22nd Street from White Avenue to Lake Avenue. And our utilities uh, were successfully completed uh, on June the 7th by Southern Constructors. As a reminder, the overhead electric lines uh, were relocated by KUB crews. New, new lines were installed um, in the alleyways to the north and south of Cumberland Avenue back in 2014 ahead of this project. All of the electrical services, or the majority of the electrical services off of Cumberland Avenue have been relocated now to these lines in the alleyways behind. There's existing um, electric lines that are still on Cumberland Avenue today. Those lines will be removed as part of the city's streetscape work. Uh, new street lights will also be installed and that is part of the city's streetscape project and the city's contractor will take care of that as well. The city's phase one work has also begun. Um, they started uh, June the 9th, and this six week closure will be a six week closure of Cumberland Avenue, and it will extend from University Commons Way to West Volunteer Boulevard. So this area, if you've driven through there, and most of you probably have, it's closed. Uh, there is a new 42 inch storm uh, water line that's to be installed during this six week time frame. So that's the reason that majority of the road has to be closed down along with other roadway improvements that the city will be performing. There is one westbound lane of Cumberland Avenue that remains open and also one eastbound lane from Volunteer Boulevard onto Cumberland Avenue. That will remain for the next six weeks with one exception. Uh, next weekend, June the 26th, uh, there will have to be a complete closure of this area Friday through Monday morning, and this will allow uh, lines to cross the Holst Knox Holston Rail at this location. So there has to be a complete road closure for that work to happen across the actual railroad. The city's plan is to have this work <coughs> uh, once they finish this six weeks of work in this location. Uh, work will then move in early July or late July, early August, up into this area. At that time, one lane of traffic in each direction on Cumberland Avenue will be allowed. So after this first six weeks of just limited uh, access through there, uh, beginning in the 1st of August, then one lane in each direction will be allowed in Cumberland Avenue while they finish work on the northern half and southern half of Cumberland Avenue, just to the east of 22nd Street. So once this work is finished, and they're expect, expected to have that finished by the end of November, then there should not have to be any more work occurring in this area. So these folks will hopefully assume the, the worst of construction at that time. Phase two for KUB and the city extends uh, along Cumberland Avenue as well. And it will pick up here at the eastern side of 22nd Street and extend to uh, 16th Street. Uh, KUB has begun our water, wastewater, and gas replacement work here at 22nd Street, and we will continue eastward in two block increments on the uh, northern half of Cumberland Avenue. That's where our water, sewer, and gas lines will be installed on the northern side of the road uh, until we again finish up here at 16th Street. We'll also be replacing the utilities in the side streets between White Avenue and Lake Avenue. That will go on as well. Our expected completion is to be July of 2016 for the utility work that we'll be performing. Uh, while we're doing our work, uh, similar to phase one, traffic will be maintained uh, one lane in each direction on the southern lanes. So that's how traffic will uh, move through while this utility work happens on the north side. The city's phase two is expected to begin December the 1st. They will also begin here at 22nd Street and they'll follow the route of the utilities and they'll work the, the northern half of Cumberland Avenue from 
from west to east. And once they get down here to between 16th and 17th, the contractor will then turn around and start back the other direction on the southern half before ultimately finishing the project here at 22nd Street in August of 2017. The city and KUV have uh, done uh, put a lot of work into making sure we inform the public of what's going on on this project. The city has created this website, uh, Cumberland Avenue or CumberlandConnects.com, and they're uh, trying to inform the public of what's going to happen and, and give people warning of the traffic plans. I've also been meeting with the uh, Cumberland Avenue Merchants Association on a regular basis, uh, trying to uh, come up with ideas of how to continue to get customers to come to the businesses there in the Cumberland Avenue area. Any questions anyone might have? Thank you. You're uh, commissioners, we talk a lot about Century Two, and we talk about the lot about pipes, etc. But in our water system. <laughs> of infrastructure, which is our water tanks. And given that you just passed the fire protection rate, a component of that uh, relates to the tanks. So we've asked Erwin Hager, our Vice President of System Operations and Plants, to really uh, give you some background about our maintenance programs for tanks. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by just doing a little bit of an overview of our water system first. Um, if you see the, the blue block in the middle of the uh, map right there, that is the Markby Whitaker water treatment plant. As you know, we treat the water there and then we pump it out into the distribution system. Uh, from there, it's pumped further into the distribution system. The black squares throughout that map right there are actually our pump stations. We call those our repump systems, or repump uh, pumps. And it pumps into the repump areas. You might consider those as kind of different pressure zones uh, for the areas in the distribution system. And then the blue circles and the red circle represent our water tanks in the system. There's 23 pump stations, 29 water storage tanks. The one in red is there because I'm going to talk a little bit more about that one, and that is our bucket mill water storage tank. Uh, a little bit about a water tank. It's just basically one big vessel of water. Um, and you look in it, and there's water in it. Um, <laughs> the bottom line, though, we look at it as there's, there's capacity reserved in those water tanks. Uh, first of all, there's emergency storage in that tank, and that's for water main breaks, things like that, uh, un unforeseen circumstances. We also have a, a capacity in a tank that's reserved for fire protection. And then, last but not least, we have the amount that's used for the daily use of our customers. Um, if you look at the chart over here on the right, this is kind of the day in the life of a water tank. Um, if you look, if you think about it, what we ideally we like to pump at a constant rate. So we'll kind of pump at the average usage for that day. So we allow the tank to, to fill and to drain based on the consumption pattern of our customer during the day. You can see during the day, customer patterns it changes throughout the day. At, at midnight to, to about 6 a.m., it's filling the tank. About 6 a.m., it kind of starts to drain the tank a little bit. Down to about 9 p.m. at night, all of a sudden, the consumption is kind of reduced by our customers and we start filling the tank back up. Back up. So that's a typical day, a typical use of, of a tank. If you notice, we're using a portion of that tank. You can see there's a large portion that's unused in the tank. And again, we've got that reserve capacity for those purposes. Um, there's another value to making <coughs> the, the tank is for getting fresh water into the tank. And make sure we get good quality mixing and good quality product in the tank. So uh, we maintain tanks, um, we do an inspection about every five years. Um, the picture on the, the right there is actually on top of a tank, so they're pretty high up on top of a, of a tank, and they're, they're harnessed and got the safety equipment. Um, they also have a robot, basically. It's an underwater robot. It's remotely operated. They disinfected that robot. They doused it with the disinfectant. The tank's in use, the customer using that tank, and we drop that robot into the tank and, and actually inspect the inside of that tank while it's still in operation. The, uh, it actually provides very high quality video and photos, and the tank's inspected as a result of that. And in less than a day, that can be happen. That can happen. So, as a result of the inspection of the inside and, ex and ex inside and exterior of the tank, we make a determination if we're going to make any improvements or not. So, if you do make improvements, you generally have to take the tank out of service, and that's just not the easiest task in the world. You kind of have to look at that. 
Um, we do an engineering computer model of the system. How do you take the tank out of service? What valves do you operate? What do you need to do to keep that service to their customers while the tank's out of service? So once, you, once that uh, engineering model is complete, we look at the results, and then we go out in the field and we, we try to exercise those valves and make sure that the model is consistent with what we see in the field. Then we coordinate with the fire department because you do have a tank out of service. Um, and then we, we configure the pump so that it can operate, maintain the pressure and the flows that are necessary for the system without a tank actually helping it out. Once that's all complete, we drain the tank and we start making the improvements. I mentioned earlier the red circle on the map, that's the Bethlehem Mill storage tank. Um, it's three quarters of a million gallon tank, 110 feet tall. Uh, it was built in 1970, so it's 45 years old. And the inspection was done just in January of this year. And we determined, based on those inspections, that we needed to make some improvements. So as we speak today, inspect, um, some improvements are being done to that tank. Uh, this is the Buffalo Mill tank, and it's, it's basically un, under, uh, I guess, a lot of improvements are taking place. The picture at the top is actually kind of a shroud, a containment shroud. The top is already covered, you can see, and this is on its way up to being lifted. Right now, you wouldn't be able to see the tank because it was being raised. It's completely contained by kind of a tent-like structure. This is looking up from the bottom, and that's the top of the tank, so you can see there's room for the contractors to actually perform the work. They're actually on the outside of the tank, they're going to, in fact, they're sandblasting the tank as we speak. They're getting it down to bare steel, and they're gonna go back and paint that tank to get it back to basically new looking condition. In addition, we just, <coughs> this is maybe the second or third mixing system we put into a tank. Generally, um, the water, I've talked about the fluctuations by the customer's demands, allow the tank to replenish itself. We're trying to make even further improvements on the quality of the product in our tanks. Um, that picture down there is actually um, of a photo of the mixing system. It's a passive mixing system. There's a, a piping that goes up a good way into the tank. And that's where the water would actually discharge into the tank. Instead of just coming in normally from the bottom of the tank and leaving from the bottom of the tank, we actually are now discharging up in the, the top. These are basically nozzles, almost like putting your finger over a, a the hose and you get a higher velocity, that's kind of what you're getting there. And you can see they're strategically directed in different ways. So the one, when the water does enter the tank, it's going to cause some turbulence and hydraulic mixing. Well, we expect this uh, effort to be complete by mid-July, so we're getting close. Uh, but again, the tank is out of service. Uh, our next steps, July will be complete. Once we complete it, we actually have to disinfect the tank. So we douse the entire inside of that tank with disinfectant. We fill it with water. It takes maybe two or three days to fill it with water. Then it takes two or three more days to allow the disinfectant to have good contact with the water that's in the tank. We continue to, to take samples, and once the samples are good, it's back open for service for the customers. Um, I, I do have a couple of photos here that's uh, of interest. This photo down here, the, sorry, the photo down here at the bottom, it was our painter avenue, pain avenue filtration tank uh, system. Um, I, basically, I guess that was one of our first water plants. It was near downtown. <coughs> you see the tank right there, 1893 that was installed. In 1950, we took that tank down and we put it right there. And so that is the same tank. That's a 122 year old tank that's in service. This is next to the old rural high school next to the football field. That's our Beaumont water storage tank. 122 years. Um, now let me explain something. The, the, <coughs> the Steel Tank Institute has something called a Century Club. There's 22 tanks in the United States that are in the Century Club. This is tied for number two in the Century Club. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. Um, 1892, 122-year-old pipe, or tank. Um, I'm also glad to say that we have another tank that's in the center of this type for number three. Uh, it's the Buffett Mill tank, or no, the um, Browns Mountain tank in South Knoxville. It's 121 years old. So um, we've got two of the 22 in the, in the Century Club, we're proud of that. And I think it goes to show that a good maintenance program and a good inspection program and continue to make improvements in your system, uh, you know, we can continue to have reliable service and good quality product to our customers. Any questions? Yes. There's a lot of concern. <coughs> <laughs> 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 
advisory council that we'll be a part of to kind of make sure we meet all the deliverables. There's a lot of things we have to make sure we get back to TVA uh, to make sure we meet the, the, the 25 percent uh, reduction, the ten dollars a square foot, all the data that needs to be submitted for that. Our role is the data, and we have to be. We know the consumption of our customers, and so throughout this entire project, KV's goal is to make sure that we show what they did use, what they're going to be using, and to make sure that we hit that metric. Because basically, if we don't achieve those two major metrics, we don't. The money does not get paid for that customer. So we got a lot of work to do to get there. Uh, those are those are hard and fast numbers to hit. The last partner is a new partner to Knoxville, but one that's been nationally recognized for their efforts. The Alliance to Save Energy is a large a national corporation that's a nonprofit that focuses on energy efficiency. They have done these similar programs in other cities throughout the country, and their role is to help us build these education tools and community outreach. They'll facilitate the meetings. They'll help us get that information out to those customers. So they're going to be a valuable partner in that educational outreach piece of this project. This also supports a lot of the programs that we're doing already. As you know, Rounded Up began in earnest last month and is off to a great start. This program has a lot of similarities, but there are some differences. Um, both those programs, Rounded Up and Extreme Energy Makeover, are about weatherization of lower income homes. So that's the similarity. The differences are, though, Extreme Energy Makeover is focused on City of Knoxville only customers. So it's just the City of Knoxville. Uh, it is focused on electric only. It's TVA's program, so it's going to be electric only customers to get affected by that. And they can apply for this, this grant. Um, it is a fixed amount of time. It's a two year project with a fixed amount of dollars. So 2016, that funding ends. On the contrary, Rounded Up is a program that's going to go on for years to come. It does, you, uh, anyway in our system can apply for it, so any of our utility customers, both over the county, other counties, anybody in our service area can apply for Rounded Up. So there's those distinct differences I wanted to point out. That there's a lot of, what I look at as extreme energy makeovers is a good kickstart for our program, but, it, but Rounded Up is a, a, a constant program throughout the, the next few years, for the next forever. Uh, Georgetown University Prize, I described that a few months ago. That's the competition we're, at with, we're, we're in with uh, 50 other cities. And that prize is given to the city that shows the most energy improvement over the next two years. So we're, we're lucky. We've got a program that's two years long that focuses on a lot of homes in Knoxville. And so that would give us a little bit of a, a leg up on the competition, per se, uh, to get that prize. That prize is up to $5 million for the city that wins. And that will go into energy efficiency also. So it's a big, you know, kind of a, it works very well in parallel with those projects. Uh, of course, it aligns directly with our blueprint. I mean, we talk about constantly when we make our utilities affordable, reliable, and safe, but we are definitely getting the affordability point. Uh, this is going to help a lot of customers tremendously, improve their quality of life, uh, increase their income for other things they can spend their money on. So it's a big deal for us. And obviously, it supports the environment. With this kind of reduction in power usage per home, um, that definitely helps our environment from that, that carbon footprint energy usage. So we're excited about that. And then lastly there, the TVA's Energy Right Program. So we're a big supporter and you know, help our customers get those, those uh, programs to implement in their homes and businesses. Uh, as you remember, a couple months ago, TVA came and presented us a bunch of awards, eight different categories we were the top performer in. This is a part of that program and just another uh, opportunity for us to help our customers become more efficient in their utilities. And with that being said, I want to introduce Beth Parsons. Beth Parsons with TVA. She's our project manager for this project. She's been assigned to Knoxville's Energy Extreme Energy Makeovers team, and she'll be keeping us uh, you know, meet regularly to talk about where we're at, where we're going. And within two and a half years or less, we'll be uh, hopefully wrapping this up with a successful program for our customers. So, thank you, Beth. Thank you, TVA, for this grant. We're excited and looking forward to kicking this thing off shortly. <laughs> With that, do you have any questions about the program? Uh, well, we're we doing success stories as the program going, or we we'll wait till it's over before we do our success stories. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I was with TVA, and I, we had that conversation about how do we communicate throughout this project. We, that's definitely on our radar, and there's also I think all the parties that you saw on that slide want to have the success stories. So yes, that is part of our plan to talk about this throughout, and then even at the back end, kind of a wrap up story. I had a question. Um, so, when they uh, they apply for CAC, yes, correct, and then if they're approved, we give them the data after it's over, and it has to be twenty five percent for it. Before, before it. and then we'll after, and then the money is given after they hit that twenty five percent, or how does? You know, the they just get it.
guarantee the 25 percent? I guess you said it has to be 25. So how do we know? So a little bit of detail. What we talked about internally when this is with CAC folks at the table, we are going to, when we pre audit the home, we're going to probably shoot for 30 percent to give us a little bit of a cushion. We don't want to miss that. Uh, so they're going to go They have a lot of tools they use to pre audit the home. This gets you so much value. Our data about what they're using is a huge part of that. So that's part of the equation. <coughs> so consuming what's consuming that energy. And so, with that being said, then they'll do the retrofits. With no doubt, we're going to hit 25%. Um, and then, as, as the project goes along, PVA reimburses CAC for those for those efforts. We have a monthly billing process that they'll go through and, and track it by the address of the home. And therefore, it's, uh, that when there's no way out for a long period of time, then you know if they don't hit if they hit 24% per se. We'll make it a smaller improvement to get 25, and we'll, we'll keep working at it. But we're going to make it pretty fell proof on the front end, if I can put it. But that's how I want to do this project. What's the uh, what's the breakdown percentage-wise between the <coughs> amount of the grant to go to education and the amount that actually goes into construction? Good question. I'll have that in front of me. I, was, <coughs> I, I do know it's it's a, a small percentage, relatively speaking. I mean, the most money goes to the actual homes. Um, that's why I have the number in front of me. I can get that for you. I want to say it's one and a half million dollar range, something like that total. Yeah, yeah that sounds um, reasonable. But it's, it's somewhere in that range, pretty close. I was just curious, how many how many homes do we think we can we can impact? Yeah, I know it's hard, <coughs> hard well, to say in different square footage. <coughs> yeah, we had to look at the average size of the home in the city of Knoxville with the lower income uh, groups. Uh, we we have committed to doing no less than twelve hundred seventy eight homes. That's our goal. Minimum. Um, we want to achieve that both the time and numbers and meet both those goals. Um, do the math at 60 homes a month for the next two years and yeah. do that. So it's a pretty aggressive schedule. And can CAC um, handle I mean, I guess my question. That was, that was actually TV if I asked that 18 times in our And what we have is CAC has been doing this for a long time. And if you remember uh, years ago, the uh, American Recovery Act was a bunch of money set aside to do these things for us. It helped create jobs and improve the economy. They did much more than that even in that period. They did a lot of homes. They did 1,500 homes in two years. Uh, this has got different measures on the back end a little bit, but, but the schedule to do it is actually a little easier than that one back in 2009 to 2010. Uh, so they are ready. They're gearing up. In fact, uh, they're ready to post. And what's going to also help us is the economy. It's going to help our local economy for the next few years. There's a lot of hiring to be done. Uh, There's not something they have to sit the staff wait to do. So there's going to be some CAC folks hired. There'll be a lot of contractors. QCN's qualified contractor network folks, so uh, we're excited about that local boost economy. So that's a that's an ancillary benefit to this whole thing if we're going to be doing a lot of work for the next two years. And do we identify candidates or CAC identifies CAC? CAC. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that's you know there's a bigger need than there always is money. And right now CAC has over 900 customers on a waiting list. I think that was part of what the PDA folks we like to see. You know, one that was a we can kick this this thing off pretty quickly. There's already a big backlog of folks that need improvements. They've looked at them, they've pre ordered them. They know they can do some improvements. So that's going to let us get cranked up pretty quick on this project and get rolling. Uh, we'll have to you know, use their criteria to make sure it's going to meet the, the $10 square foot, 25% reduction. But they're already gone through an audit already once. So that's going to allow us to get really started really fast. Um, and so the contractor determines where they purchase building materials or, I mean, could we partner with like? Yeah. That's a great question. We uh, CAC folks are talking about that. What we're what they're proposing to do is a combination of multiple things. You know, we know insulation will be a pretty much a standard mm -hmm. that's a given across older homes. So the CAC folks are talking about purchasing lots of insulation, lots of water heaters. Remember, those are pretty low cost, big benefit things. And allow the contractor to pick them up and, and get that get that shorten that timeline down and get buy in bulk. So you get a better price. Shorten the cost, right? And shorten it. The more we save per home, the more homes we do. And we want to spend as we want to do as many homes, fifteen million dollars as we possibly do. Um, and so that's the goal. And so the uh, so they're talking about that plus some kind of bringing on equipment. You know, we have a combination of a lot of things and already started down that path. But things we know we use a lot of. Let's go ahead and buy a pallet of it in big bulk, and you know you can get a better price. I mean, guarantee you know twenty thousand square feet of insulation and so many water heaters uh, as part of the deal. So that's a, we're really excited about that opportunity too. And CAC is working through Knox County. Only for homeowners, not a renters, right? It is. We I forgot how we determined that at the end of the day. It's for homeowners particularly, uh, but 
if you own, but if you are a renter and you can get your homeowner to apply, it applies to that also. It's not meant for apartments or things like that, but it can be if a homeowner owns property and wants to apply to this, there, that's fine also. Uh, let me just make a couple of comments. I want to thank TVA for this. Um, $15 million in <coughs> the city of Knoxville for our customers is a huge benefit. So when you see your, your friends from TVA out in the community, please thank them for this. And I also want to recognize the KUB staff and the CAC staff who made this application, competed for it, fought for it, justified the TVA that we could accomplish this because it was a very competitive process and they asked, TVA asked every question under the sun and I think uh, KUB and CAC convinced them that we could actually deliver. So we intend to deliver on it. Uh, it it's going to be a big project and a lot of work, but a big benefit for our customers who need it the most. So thanks to Gabe and Liz and everybody who's working on this. We appreciate it. Some more questions? Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. This is our good news day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we have other issues, but um, I want to recognize Thelis Kimball. Thelis is an electrical engineer for us, and you've seen him before because he was sitting in those chairs last year as a member of the Leadership Development. Uh, program. Uh, about 10, 12 years ago, the board created a metric on electric reliability. I mean, bottom line, KUB's service for electric service should be reliable. And the board created a metric, and as you know, over that time, we've given you numerous presentations about how we've used technology, how we have responded to outages, and how we've tried to truly improve our electric reliability. Well, we've accomplished a lot of progress, and we have an announcement today to recognize the list to share. Thank you, Ms. Roach. Commissioners, I can tell you from personal experience, Ms. Roach is being modest. Executive staff is very excited about this designation. Uh, we were award, we were notified uh, a few months ago that KUB would be awarded the Reliable Public Power Provider designation from the American Public Power Association. Here's what I'll call it RP3, because it's just a whole lot of P's in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm here today to tell you a little bit about that program and, and the effort it took to achieve the designation. <coughs> so what is RP3? The program is really an opportunity for uh, utilities to get better. The program challenges utilities to develop a, a, a culture of operational excellence benchmarking uh, their programs, processes, and their strategic uh, strategies, their strategic efforts against known industry best practices. <coughs> uh, the program is, in essence, a combination of APPA and its member utilities coming together to give applicant utilities the opportunity to look at all of their uh, programs, processes in those four categories and Say what are we doing? Uh, what are we doing that we can improve upon? What are we doing that needs to be uh, brought up to standards? And encourages the utilities to again seek operational excellence by benchmarking, benchmarking their programs. Excuse me. So we were awarded the highest designation for this uh, in this program. Uh, going into it, we were uh, a little bit hesitant. We did feel confident that we would receive the platinum designation. Uh, that requires a score of about 90 to 98. But we actually scored 99 out of 100, so we really knocked it out of the park. Uh, and that's what generated the buzz and excitement. That's why I'm standing before you today. Uh, it could have been just a acknowledgement from Ms. Roach and turned into a board presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only about 6% of applicants receive the highest designation on their first uh, attempt. Uh, and only 10% of the utilities currently have this designation, but this is uh, gaining a lot of traction. It's becoming very popular in the public power uh, industry. So uh, what did it take to achieve this designation? It was a fairly significant effort. Back in the fall of 2013, a small team was put together to collect, develop, and organize the documentation that would be required to be submitted with the application. Uh, we had to reach out to dozens of uh, individuals across the organization.
organization management support was crucial uh, to the success of the application. Uh, again, we started in fall of 2013. We actually submitted our application in the fall of 2014 to receive designation in the, the spring of 2015. So it's been a long process again. Uh, for the past six months, all we've been talking about is RP3. And uh, we're glad to, to, have, to be bringing you this news right now. It's kind of, this presentation is sort of the capstone uh, on this entire process. It's, it's been a, a long and arduous uh, process. Again, over a thousand pages of documentation, 12 months. We actually gave ourselves enough time to fix any challenges that we may have come across in the process. We actually worked with a consultant who gave us a lot of good feedback. We wanted to give ourselves enough time to correct anything that he found uh, to, to be questionable. And I'll talk about him again. Commissioners, you've also seen these programs, have heard uh, KB executive staff talk about these programs. Uh, these are key to the application, but they're also key to being a reliable public power provider in any service territory. Um, and with your governance and your leadership and guidance, we've been able to fund and implement these programs with a high level of success. It's reflected in the score that we're given on the application. Uh, having a culture of safety, uh, investing in Structure, uh, developing your employees and working with your peers uh, in the industry to tackle challenges like uh, energy efficiency is all considered the best leading practices in the industry. So we were uh, recognized in the May edition of the Public Power magazine. We wanted to share that with you. Which kind of to illustrate that a lot of utilities are getting involved in this program. Uh, this Again, this was our first attempt at it. We were very successful. Currently about 200 uh, utilities have the de designation, excuse me, about 100 utilities applied uh, in 2015. Like I said, commissioners, we worked with a uh, consultant, Mr. Paul Allen, he was the uh, former VP of engineering at service. He also uh, was a former RP3 panel member and he had a lot of good things to say about our application but he really was impressed with our workforce development section and he shared with us some comments that we thought it up to executive staff and we thought it would be worth sharing with you. Um, he had not seen any utility put as much thought and care into the development of their workforce development uh, application and their programs and he was very impressed. And finally, commissioners, uh, the application team uh, has been asked to join us today. As you can see, uh, some of them were LDP participants, and I, I've been told to ask that they please stand and be recognized. Uh, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Bivens, Business Processes. Marcy Hendrick, Human Resources. And Lori Hart Hartzog from Engineering. Thank you guys. The managers did a very good job of selecting these individuals, the individuals to work on this application team. They made my life very easy. They were very easy to work with. Their hard work is that it was a, a long process and we spent a lot of time <laughs> together. team effort reaching out to individuals across the organization, management support. Uh, this is really a big win for, for KUB. And uh, I think it, it validates the, our current course, it validates our organization vision. Uh, I think uh, it, it validates all that we're doing as, as a utility to make sure that we are positioned to provide reliable public power to our customers here today and in the future. So if you have any questions, I'll be <laughs> and and I, I want to echo what Thela said, and I'm so happy he said it, because everyone in this organization understands that leadership starts here, and your funding of Century 2 and the programs that we have is what's led to this result. The people can't do it without the funding, so I know it's difficult when you have to raise rates, but it's important for you to know it's having an impact, so we thank you for that support of the system. Uh, any anecdotes or anything you can share about the process that you learned, you thought that was 
important that you might, um, now this is over, you know, that you <laughs> apply to, that you might apply to your you know, general day-to-day -day business or anybody else here? A general anecdotes about the experience. Uh, it was my first time leading the team on such a big effort. Uh, I do understand now the importance of having a good, a strong team to support you. Uh, these individuals here are, are incredible. Uh, some of them left on maternity leave. <laughs> 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 They were very well committed I mean, in the process. Before they left, they, would make, they made sure we were on the right course. They came back, they picked up right where they left off. It's important to have a great team, and I, we couldn't have done it. Uh, I couldn't have done it with a better group of people. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any more business items? Yes, we do. Washington Pike, and I'm a property owner to city taxpayer for the last 65 years, I guess. I bought a property from uh, Fannie Mae on Tennessee Avenue here back in the winter, and I had it permitted to renovate. And uh, KB has placed a storm sewer within 20 feet of my front door. And I'm not going to spend fifty thousand dollars renovating this and having people come in and smell this serious, serious odor. And they have made this house uh, unfit for human habitation just because of the obnoxious gases that pours into the properties. And I own properties up and down. Tennessee beside this particular house. And I have here a picture of the house that I'm renovating, but I stopped renovation work on it uh, May the 22nd. But <coughs> my workers were getting sick, having to work and smell these gas fumes, and they are horrible. I have put on the back some note that explains what uh, my problem here is at uh, 2126 and 2138 Tennessee Avenue. Now that's, that is just a little bit north of Schofield and Tennessee Avenue. And I, I want to make these a part of the record. Uh, and I have a picture here of myself sitting there in front of this property. And on the back of this, I also have uh, what I am alleging is a problem, a serious problem for the, not only my properties, but other people's properties also. And I want to make this picture a part of the record. And thirdly, I've been an electrical contractor for 50 plus years. I study the National Electrical Code constantly. I get a new revised version every other year. And I'm very well familiar with the electrical systems here in the city of Knoxville. And I know when there's issues that are improperly uh, installed on public properties, I can recognize them when I pass by them. And I'm right in front of this particular house, some thieves have cut off the wiring, the grounding rod up at the top of their hand down to the connection at the ground. And uh, it's dangerous.
because electricity seeks the least path of resistance. And that's something all of us should be able to realize. And the child walking down through there reaches over and touches this uh, pole and it could be energized with as many as 166,000 volts. It's enough to fry anyone. And a lot of kids come through there and they'll get off on the bicycle and they'll lean it up against this metal pole. And there's a possibility, there's a possibility that someone will be hurt if it's not corrected properly. The KUB went over, I think maybe yesterday, and they put a Mickey Mouse fix on it. I just want to remind you, it's a five-minute limit. You have about okay, a minute I'm left. about ready to wind it up. And I just want to let you know that I have five minutes. i wasted a lot of time. The house is shut down, and I'm going to give you a notice according to the nuisance law. And if it's not corrected in the next uh, short time, my attorneys will be meeting each one of you in the courtroom, and I'd like to leave this with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank you for your time.